Yes, hello. This is the Ultra Culture Podcast. I'm Jason Louv, and today I'm talking to Tobias Churton, who has written two biographies of Aleister Crowley, including his latest, Aleister Crowley, The Beast in Berlin, Art, Sex, and Magic in the Weimar Republic. Tobias, how are you? We're on the, uh, we're on the show. Hello, Los Angeles. Yes, hello. <laughs> uh, so I've just been sent your, your remarkable book, Aleister Crowley, The Beast in Berlin, by Inner Traditions, which is your second biography of, of Aleister Crowley. And this one focuses uh, on a very particular time in his life, uh, which is uh, about the two-year period that he was in Berlin trying to kick off his career as a painter. And, and and experiencing the Weimar Republic and kind of interfacing with the local German occult groups. Is that, that's a very, very succinct summary, but um, is that about right? Yes, I think he was trying to put his whole life and message on a new footing. And he was, it was his last, last throw, in a way, uh, of freedom. Um, after after his Berlin time, he gets he gets almost stranded in England. If you if you can be stranded in England, I think you can be when you can't express yourself artistically. And Berlin was the last place where he could really let fly uh, within the very limited means at his disposal there, but it, and have some intellectual and cultural impact. Um, the, but of course, all that was lost because of what happened after with the ascension of Hitler. So, what I've done is reconstructed. Uh, uh, the the Titanic of late Weimar Republic Germany and put uh, Crowley in his proper place in it and it, we can see it now for the first time so it, it, it's almost like um, multi-dimensional archaeology right excellent so so uh, it's a fascinating period both in his life and in European history and in a lot of ways uh, you know Crowley is always kind of reflecting the the broader cultural uh, uh, world that he's in and 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 still is reflecting that back to us in a lot of ways. But I'm curious, um, how much was he? Uh, uh, you know, w- he was kind of on the the uh, the cutting edge there, the avant garde. But um, you're talking about he has a certain period of freedom in in Berlin. It kind of seems to me that might have been the only freedom available in Europe at the time. Is that is that the case? Certainly, the level of personal liberty which you could enjoy in Berlin was unique to that city at that time. In the late 20s and early 30s, very early 30s, up until uh, the end of 31, uh, Berlin was the freest city in in the world and the most modern. And in terms of your self-expression, of your sexuality, or your ideological beliefs, or your uh, artistic and political ideals, the, the scope for self-expression was very, very great and uh, probably hadn't been anything quite like it since the Belle Epoque in uh, Paris. Um, but it was very much more under threat than the decadent period of, of, of Paris. So there was always, there was this sort of looming shadow. People felt that it could all come to an end. There was a, an underlying fragility. So the volatility of Berlin in that period, I think it was remarkably apposite for Crowley's conception of a new aeon coming to birth out of the ashes of the old world. You got modernity in its purest form in Berlin at that time. I remember seeing a piece of film, um, black and white film from, a, I think, about 1928, 29, and it's Buster Keaton, the great Hollywood comedian and uh, silent film director, Standing uh, in Berlin, surrounded by this uber modern over over overhead um, trains that look like they're out of Metropolis, Fritz Lang, um, and he's standing there, sort of uh, astonished, almost like a person who's arrived on another planet. And uh, that sort of, it sort of gave me that it, it it was a city which would make a clown of you or a sage of you. It would make something of you just standing in it because the the the, the atmosphere of dynamic change was so very strong at that time. So this is a really fascinating period in in his life for me because he's really trying to get something going and he's kind of been frustrated many times in the past and and uh you know his his life up to this point has been so varied. Uh he had been a mountain climber, he had, you know, been a member of the Golden Dawn um and he, you know, had been through many marriages and um you know the kind of cro- the first Crowley that people think of, I think, generally, 
is kind of in the past around the World War I era, uh, where he's running around the desert with Victor Neuberg and, and uh, publishing the Equinox, and that's kind of the occult Crowley that people think of. It's amazing how short a period the Crowley that most people know about takes place in. And <laughs> here was a man who was condemned before sort of the age of 26. Most most artists are permitted a kind of early period of going too far and getting it wrong, and then a, those years are reinstated later as the as the folly de jeunesse. Crowley was condemned almost on impact on arrival in, in, in English uh, society. How, how do you mean exactly? Is, w- w- do you mean with the well, court well, cases? If you, if you, most, most of the accounts that I, I've seen of Crowley tend to focus on the fact that he bought his house in Beleskin and he lived by Loch Ness and he had a battle with the Golden Dawn. These were things that were happening when he was only just graduated from university. The vast scope of his life is often missed completely. Um, and I think that's another reason why the Berlin years are so important, because they crystallize the later Crowley. And the later Crowley, to my way of thinking, is actually more interesting, to me anyway, hmm. than, than the, um, the mountain climbing, going to India, Crowley. That, that is par- the, the problem was Crowley had written his life story, his autobiography, which was published in 1929, uh, just before he, he went to Berlin, and it it's it stops uh, in Cefalu in Sicily, and I think for most people's concept of, of Crowley, that's pretty well where it stops as well. So the story really only goes up to 1922 in his autobiography. He he never wrote uh, a, a further biography of the next 25 years of his life. So in in that sense, that's been a joy for me to do. Right, that's amazing. That. That's amazing. Yeah, it's fascinating that you bring that up because uh, uh, th- that is most people's conception of Crowley. Because, uh, yeah, people do seem to remember that part, and then it's oh, and then he, you know, he died in Hastings. Uh, yes, he's supposed to sort of die in squalor and all the rest of it. Another, Which is not true, false apparently. Idea, right? Yes, <laughs> that, that's not quite the truth, is that? Um... Oh, it's it couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, this this notion that Crowley um, was that was a, a poet modi, a damned poet who rises with wealth who then makes a pact with darker forces which lead him to be uh, to, to to plummet to the earth and then slowly disappear in squalor and horror and you know dies uh, forgotten in a in a some sort of awful place allegedly in hastings this is a this is a journalist's wishful uh, hmm. thinking his life wasn't like that at all it went through ma- amazing changes after he was kicked out of Cefalu by order of Mussolini, the dictator, hmm. uh, I find his life after then is 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 really rather heroic. His early life was heroic in the sense that he was trying to imitate a hero, Sir Richard Burton, and he was right. into world travel and exploring and producing beautiful books and, and generally being uh, brilliant and outrageous both. Uh, but the... the after after Chefalu, the heroism is quite real. He is he does fight for survival, but he wins this fight. This should be recognised. He overcame. He didn't die in a street broken down, a drug addicted moron who'd lost his skills. This is just not true at all. And um, in Berlin, we see a man in his mid fifties running down Kafirstendam in love with a nineteen year old girl from Los Angeles, from Santa Barbara, I should say, to be specific, um, uh, uh, who's an artist like himself and who, who's fallen in love with him and he, he with her. He's, he's living with a flower child in Berlin in 1931. I mean, and, and very active. And he's taken on by two of the greatest art promoters of Berlin at the time, Karl Nierendorf and, uh, and von Alfensleben, hmm. um, who runs an amazing organisation which the Nazis destroyed called Porza which is where Crowley, the only British artist, to have a solo exhibition in Berlin in that period. And uh, he's manifesting as what he really was, an artist. And I think we can... You think, we you think that's Crowley really true? As, sorry, if we approach Crowley as an artist, um, we'll get much closer to the real man than the Magus. <laughs> well, that, that's fascinating, right? That, that um, you know, of all of his, his immense output, uh, you know, his, his incredible writing and... and Middling poetry and and um, uh, his instructional material, and then his autobiography, and so on and so forth. Um, that's fascinating that you think that his art career is actually where he really finds his his um, feet. Is that 
I, I, I'm not saying it's where he finds the essence of his existence. He projects okay. his real self in his art, and it's an it's a non didactic form. So we're seeing, as it were, his soul, or as he would say, he painted the will. His painting is he's just seeing he, he's uh, he's seeing life in his pure, uh, purely as an artist. He's not ideologically trying to persuade. Mm. He's not he's not advocating a theory or in dispute. It's his vision. It's his vision of life, and that's uh, I think is precious. And the and the few paintings that have come down to us uh, that have survived, you know, that the, that the Gestapo didn't destroy, and uh, that that have come out are an indication that he was a truly modern artist. He wasn't this archaic throwback. This sort of sometimes magicians are very often portrayed as as nostalgic or. Um, how can I say, romantic figures that are reacting against their era. Crowley's quite the opposite. He's, he's in the turbo charge of modernity. And we see that in Berlin, what a modern mind he was. And that often when we misjudge him during the Edwardian period, which was his heydays when he, he probably was the most energetic and he was the most willful, um, in the art, both artistically, but also intellectually. Uh, he's, he's, He's not always true to himself in that period. There is much more of the poser about mm. him. And we get the real Crowley, I think, after the First World War, when he's on his uppers, when he's got to struggle. And um, he's had to learn many hard lessons about himself and the world. But the one thing he, he knows is he likes, moder- he likes the modern world. In many ways, he's appropriate for it. He stood out like a sore thumb in the, in the first decade of the 20th century mm. somehow he's starting to fit in berlin and had it not been for the catastrophe of hitler uh his life and our feel our knowledge of him would be very very different i'm sure he would have been known um uh, prim- primarily in terms of an artist who had a an exciting and um how can i say notorious early life interesting so so it, it almost sounds like you're uh, suggesting that the mature Crowley is Crowley the artist and that everything we know of Crowley is, is uh, uh, popularly as the magician and writer is uh, a precursor to that or an immature period? Or would no, that be oversimplifying? No, it's not all. Im- I mean, uh, no, not entirely. But I think you can come to the other through the artist. If you come to the esoteric Crowley through the art, you'll have a more balanced picture of the kind of person he really was. I see. Uh, you've, the trouble is people look on the internet or something and they see this picture, one photo taken, you know, in maybe in 1908 or 1910 where he, he's wearing costume from the uh, def, then defunct Golden Dawn and he's making horn symbols with his thumb. And that's the picture that stays because that's the most journalistically acceptable image. And, and, Crowley, in some ways, underestimated the power of those photographs. He was having a bit of fun when he was, mm. whenever he was photographed, he was always having a bit of fun. And but those photos are taken very seriously, you know. They're rather as if, because of their theatricality, they now remind us of pictures from horror movies, or right? That sort of thing. So it's about correcting the image of Crowley. I think there's a lot of people out there have gone through periods in life where. Crowley's appealed to them for one reason or another, maybe the power of his intellect or some of his uh, libertarian viewpoints are attractive. But there's always the feeling, yeah, but he was a bit of a this and he was a bit of a that and he probably dabbled too much in that and he was a, was he a drug addict, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this image of Crowley becomes, well, I can do without the whole thing sort of thing. I, I, I think I would say that the precious insights that you get from Crowley are worth keeping and they're best kept if you think of him primarily as an artist but the kind of artist that was prevalent in Paris in the late 1880s 1890s which also was very theatrical if you think of somebody like Josephin Pelladin uh, the great promoter and starter of the of his own Rosicrucian Catholic order a uh, remarkable man um He's almost a precursor of Crowley. If you start to see Crowley in terms of the decadent and the symbolist art that is coming through in Paris in that period, 
you just get a you you get you'll be able to actually appreciate the other aspect, the esoteric aspect of Crowley so much better that he was he was operating on all these fronts. Um, okay. Okay. You know, and, and the, the word Satanism, for example, if you look at it in terms of Paris in the eighteen eighties, mm. isn't uh, advocating something out of a Dennis Wheatley novel. Mm. It's it's a suggestion of a way of life which despairs of the world as it is. And in that sense, confronts bourgeois, what they were, you know, the great enemy of that period for the artist was bourgeois philistinism, an attitude that only money mattered, that your life could be measured in material terms uh, primarily, and you should always be respectable. And Crowley, of course, would say, wonderful line, I think, he said, you can be respected or you can be respectable, but you can't be both. <laughs> Uh, I think Crowley, Crowley comes over in the, in the Berlin years as, as a man worthy of the respect of people who know something about life. Um, you know, that that's, that's would be the qualification. If you know a bit about how hard it is to be an individual in a hostile environment, and to be an individual is almost always to be in a hostile environment, mm. uh, you, 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 get love, you get love and respect for this uh, strange visitor to, to the human story. Right. Uh, so sounds maybe not so different from the, the struggle today. And, and, uh... It's the struggle, yes, exactly, the struggle of every individual. Okay. But it's a romantic idea, of course, and modern, uh, what we now call modern thought, it wasn't modern in uh, the 30s, but it's a more modern view now to say that the individual doesn't really matter as an individual. You know, that right. uh, we're just carrying on genetic components. Right. Well, I, 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 I don't buy that. The, gen- the genes give us the vehicle, but not the uh, spark that makes it worthwhile. And uh, that's uh, certainly uh, a large appeal of Crowley to me is the bringing that out, that individual spark. And I yes, want to circle really, back a little exactly bit. exactly right. I wanted to circle back a little bit. I want to touch on. Um, uh, I want to definitely touch on uh, what Crowley has to tell us today. But I want to circle back a bit, and and we had touched on the uh, you know the negative image of Crowley, which almost you know invariably seems to have to be addressed in in any media about him. Um, and one of the most fascinating things about your biographies, and also the kind of biographical renaissance of, about Crowley that's been going on with Kaczynski's Portorabo and some of the other, uh, and to some extent, uh, Lawrence Sutton's book, um, is how much of the the negative image of Crowley turns out to simply be fabrication, whether uh, journalistic fabrication or, um, you know, from John Simmons book. Um, you know, I was shocked to read, to read um, you know, many of these recent, you know, your biographies and some of these other recent biographies and discover that uh, most of the scare stories about Crowley were simply not true, and the image of him that emerged was, you know, of a kind of a uh, bohemian uh, kind of, you know, uh, trying several different schemes, trying to find himself, and and often frustrated by the people around him, or maybe impatient with the people around him. But the, for the most part, um, there are no, uh, you know, there there's certainly nothing more shocking than the average behavior of the the average, you know, young person today. I think. C- certainly today, <laughs> right? <laughs> certainly today. Um, no, I mean they were. I mean every artist uh, who wanted to be recognised was always out to shock, uh, as they are today. In that sense, you're absolutely right. I mean, just the ability to shock. Uh, Crowley probably was a bit more shocking because he didn't only offend the. Ma- he didn't only appear to offend to some people, um, the social mores of the time. But there was the religious aspect with Crowley. I believe what's really held against Crowley is that he was much more outspoken in his opposition to Christianity as he had experienced it. Right. And it is that which means that in the reactionary mind uh, in the Western world particularly, that marks him out as... They won't allow him to be Percy Bysshe Shelley, who is outrageous in youth but eulogised in death. And no, Crowley must be seen to show that those who reject Christianity must come to a bad end. 
Mm. And if he didn't come to a bad end, then we must present it as if he came to a bad end. And anyone who is interested in him comes to a bad end. They don't ask this of Marcus Aurelius or, or any of the later uh, uh, the Roman emperors until Constantine, that their paganism should lead them to a bad end. But there is a cultural prejudice in the Western world that those who resist the atonement of Jesus on the cross, those who resist it, I have forsaken the consideration of the culture. And what is remarkable is that even though a large part of our educated uh, cognoscenti today are not Christians or not really Christians, um, they still are prepared to buy a great deal of the medievalism um, of that of, of the older Christian culture, namely that if you don't go with the atonement, you must be working for uh, Satan, mm. you know. I found this very often as a strange superstition in the modern rationalist. Um, they don't believe in God, but they're kind of afraid of those who do, which is almost, uh, as I say, you know, they want to... I, I remember um, a famous British atheist scientist in this country made the sign of the cross to me at a salon one afternoon <laughs> uh, because he was afraid that I was suggesting there was more to reality than genes and atoms. You know, right? Yeah. I, I In other you... words, that 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 I I was saying that scientific measurement did not exhaust reality, uh, and he immediately clicked that I must be a romantic believer in all sorts of what he would consider mumbo jumbo. So I I think Crowley, of course, uh, will always be in for that. If you could find, if they found one day that he was a good card carrying Christian and loved Jesus and uh, had, had confessed his sins and was sorry for all the bad things he'd done, um, then, of course, they, I think they'd be quite prepared to say that he was a pretty interesting character and allow a movie to be made about him. But um, Crowley really believed that the Christian era was, was past. Now, let us be clear about that. That didn't mean he had no interest in Jesus or the teaching as he saw it. But he was one of the first to recognize, along with Carl Jung, uh, the importance of the Gnostic tradition. And I think his view was pretty much, well, if Jesus existed, one component of the story was a Gnostic teacher, and he had nothing against that. What he couldn't abide was the kind of Protestant religion, particularly Protestant religion. He has much less of a beef with the Catholics, oddly enough, because the Catholics still believed in magic, at the effectively. But the, but the, the Protestant uh, tradition, which is that without accepting the Protestant format of the forensic atonement, the blood of Jesus, uh, as being the salvific moment, if you don't accept that, you've had it, you're out. Hmm. Yeah, it's that. This is this is the problem, really. I, I, you can't. It's no good me sitting here and trying to defend Crowley's individual acts. That somebody may say, you know, he let a woman down here. You know, he he was not as friendly to this friend as some people might have been. They think the real essence of Crowley's challenge is that he was propounding a new religion or a synthesis of a lot of actually old traditions of spirituality. But this synthesis that he was proposing was revolutionary. And if taken up by a state in the Western world, because it's very unlikely it would be in the East these days, but if, it, if, if the Crowleyan synthesis of Salima was actually taken up, it would be a fundamental change in the direction of human progress. And he was advocating that. And that's the threat. That's what worries people. Hmm. Uh, of course, he he uh, displayed some initial interest with, um, I think, prior to this time with with getting Hitler interested in the Book of the Law, but then had he it quite had, hadn't he, quite. He never had realized. anything but a, a, a mu mu he only mused on that. It wasn't oh, him. Okay. It was one of his followers, Martha Kunzel, and ah. she she was she was under the illusion, as he told her, under the illusion that somehow Hitler could prepare the way for Philema. Uh, and that he had, he was 
saving the national will of Germany. And Crowley's view was, what do you mean? What is this national will bullshit? Mm. There's no national will here. We're talking, he said, he was talking about, basically, he said Hitler is an Old Testament prophet type who uh, wields um, a magical power over people's negative hates and manipulates them. So, he, no, I th- the idea that... He, he did see, I mean, Hitler had said some things which suggested that he had some potential to, to launch a, a better Germany. But as Crowley realized very quickly, um, he was so overwhelmed by his uh, negative, un- unconscious sides that, I mean, he was totally perverse. And uh, as, as for his ideas about the Jews... Crowley regarded the Jews as the best things that had had, had dignified and saved what was worthwhile in German culture. I mean, he outraged Martha by saying Mm. that the average German was like a monkey compared to the Jews. (laughs) This is would hardly endear him to the to the racist bigot, uh, loony perverts, whatever you want to throw at those um, at, at the Nazi hardcore. Right. So no, he, he he was, but he was interested in the idea of challenging the Catholic, Protestant, ideological domination of Europe. And in a lot of ways, he's he's well in line with kind of the Rosicrucian and Free Masonic tradition in that way, which had had, had challenged these. Uh, well, certainly, it challenged the Catholic Church in in Europe. Is that accurate? It, bro- bro- broadly, so yes, uh, but but Crowley wasn't the sort of person who advocated, you know, if, if you set up a new institution, imposed it on people, you've improved the world. He wasn't interested in that at all. His idea was that that the Thelemic idea would eventually sink into the subconscious of humanity for its because of its useful truth, i.e., its magical value. In other words, it worked as a principle. Mm. Um, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. Must seem to anybody who's who's unless they're a born sheep. Uh, as as common sense, you know, you you've got to find the divine in your existence and work with that, and not interfere with other people's Dennis destiny. Right. I mean, it's it's uh, it's a very commonsensical viewpoint. You could say. I mean, he he often said, "Look, Saint Augustine, the one of the great saints of the church, said the same thing: love and do what thou wilt. Do you? That's it." St. Paul talks about the true but uh, Christian as being a man who is a law or a woman is a law unto themselves because they love God, i.e. the highest they can conceive of, and they have love for their fellow man and they enter a life of service of the highest. And Thelema is, he, he, he knew that Thelema had appeared in Rabelais' writings. Rabelais was a good doctor and uh, had been a monk. And it was an ancient principle, but it was taking thousands of years to be generate to be generate into a into a dominant principle, and it still is. It, it's still coming. Uh, the value of Crowley has yet to be seen. Mm. Although I think, when I think about the post-war world, I see a lot of very positive um, outcomes. I mean, if you look at in England, I, I obviously know a bit better, but. Uh, we have a thing called the Butler Education Act, which came out in 1944, which said that the point of state education was for the, to, for the individual to realise themselves. Now, that may, we now take that as common sense, as normal, but that wasn't the attitude of education in the 19th century. In, when Crowley grew up under fundamentalist parentage, you had to whip the offending Adam out of the boy and instill the urge to obedience within the boy. And that was what education meant. It wasn't platonic. Plato had said, education is a system of remembrance of our pre-mortal existence. And the arts and sciences bring us back to our spiritual nature. That is the essence of the initiation of life, life Mm. as an initiation. Mm. Uh, These principles you will find in mature masonry and uh, in the... uh, the I would I would say the mature Rosicrucian tradition, as opposed to some of the the freakeries on <laughs> that have grown up or, around it. Right. Now it's fascinating that you're you're saying this. Uh, one, uh, and also some of the things that you were saying about Crowley's attitude towards Christianity and Gnosticism, 
there's mm. an there's an element of Crowley where his attack on uh, social mores and his attack on Christianity, as you were saying, is really kind of a, um, an attack on the external trappings or the the kind of sleepwalking state that uh, might today be much more found in in scientism, you know, as, yes. as you had mentioned. But at this, but you know, with one hand, but with the other so hand, he, uh, bringing hates, out the he, real tradition. What he hates, sorry, Jason. What mm-hmm. he, I would just make this little point. Mm-hmm. What he's against is what he calls the slave gods. Right. Any any concept. It doesn't have to be Christian. Could be, as you say, scientism. Any concept which puts man under the whiplash of an alleged superior being. This is what his objection is about. Is man being scared of being man. That's what he's against. His whole life was an assertion of man, and if that requires a bit of blasphemy to show that you're alive and you're conscious and you have a relationship with the universe, uh, so be it. Uh, It was the slave gods uh, he was trying to bring down because the trouble with religions is there's usually a core of wonderful spiritual teaching which at some point enters our, our, our consciousness and we subscribe to it but if you go along with the institutional religion you will always if you go along far enough you will find that they end up being schoolmasters with a stick Mm. and europe had been living under this stick for nearly two thousand years and that stick was carried over to america to some extent although in america you have this uh, distinction of the state and religion and it was a healthy distinction you didn't have that in large parts of Europe. Hello? Yes. Jason? Yes, you can still hear yeah, me. Sorry, that, that's, yep. let's be clear. That's, that's what it's about. That's what the argument with Christianity is about. It's not right. about whether you like Christmas or, you know, uh, Easter or you pray or you go to church and you believe in, in, in angels and spirits and saints and, and all that. that. That's your business if that's the way you reach your... Uh, your ideal that's that's your business he, he was it was the oppression of the soul that he was right. concerned with I so believe. so one of the uh and i certainly agree and i think that one of the, the the scary things about crowley is that he um he attacks that and he attacks the kind of sleepwalking um uh faith in the slave gods as, as you might say uh, and with his other hand, he's kind of handing, um, he's not giving a comfortable dogma to replace it. There's certainly the philosophy of Thelema, but he's he's giving people a handful of very brutally difficult techniques, um, which very few of his students um, kind We're of went, went all yes. the way with, you know, uh, yeah. including Neuberg and some of his Scarlet Women and, and things like that. You know, they, they, they weren't quite uh, up, to up to Crowley's level, right? That's right, yeah which would be very hard to, to pull off. Um, and for people today assessing his teaching, you know, it's difficult because he's coming out of a classical education. Uh, there's Greek, Latin, Hebrew, um, you know, many different languages. You know, he requires a very, um, you know, formal logic, scientific training. Uh, and then, you know, and then you get into the very complex, uh, the complexities of Kabbalah and the physical difficulties of yogic training, which is kind of the work of a, the work of a lifetime and very difficult for, you know, uh, people now, especially young people now who may be, uh, you know, working full time to pay off student debt or uh, certainly don't have the leisure time that Crowley as an, you know, an heir of a, of a, of a small fortune had. Um, so, so that's kind of challenging to say the least. And, and I think that's probably part of the, um, you know, he doesn't offer a quick fix. He shows you a tremendous problem and then offers you no quick fixes for it. Yes, if you want a quick fix, I don't know really where you'd go other than the, to the chemist. <laughs> uh, or as you say, do you say the drugstore or is there drugstores just groceries? Well, it depends it? on what, what substance, but uh, uh, yes, well, the drugstore. Well, we have a chemist where you go for headache pills or whatever. Yeah, the, you, yeah, the pharmacy. Um, a, a, a pharmacy, you'd say, yeah, pharmacy. So if you want a quick fix, go to the pharmacy. Right. Uh, Crowley was talking about the, the, the evolution of human civilization. He wasn't expecting, <laughs> he wasn't expecting, certainly not in his lifetime and not in our lifetime, that this... Um, these these changes in in fundamental premises of progress would be taken. Uh, he thought he, he thought there would be a change, you know, within the next 
thousand years. You know, that sort of, it's that sort of idea. Um, he, he's he's working on a very large scale. He's still uh, in line with the Rosicrucian tradition that there are secret chiefs, that there are there are benevolent forces in the universe which are higher than uh, the man in his physical condition, and that man's job, not every man, <laughs> he never thought that. What he would say, the kings of of the species, that they should get in touch with higher intelligence. Uh, and some of, a lot of his magic is about uh, ways of getting in touch with higher intelligence and testing it. And um, I think uh, I think anybody who's ever been inspired knows that there's higher. There is something called higher intelligence. Now, if you say it's it's grey matter, then all right, you can argue whether it, is it mind or brain. You know, uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg? The, the, you know, our, our ability to think and conceive of the idea of brain seems to be much more important than the idea of a brain telling us what to think. Uh, there is a dimension of the human experience particularly, but I, I dare say it's in other aspects of nature, we just don't experience them, um, although some, I believe, believe they do. Uh, we are aware of a higher light. Now, Christianity is full of doctrines about the light, and come Christmas, which is Fast approaching, uh, we'll hear all about the light. And uh, in the beginning, there's, there's a light and there's a word, there's a spiritual dimension which is made flesh and and dwells amongst us. You know, it's this is, and this is the the the, the first mystery of thinking about uh, life beyond the visible. Now, Crowley would say this is so far so good. Uh, he would then say, I think, that the, the church is to some extent have hijacked this whole sphere of life beyond the visible and turned it into something instead of which is uplifting, that very often, very often functions as a dogmatic oppressor of man. But, you know, religions also evolve. Crowley was interested in the evolution of the species and what was going to change. So if you say to me, well, it's very difficult for people today to find the time um, to meditate or to concentrate for a minute on themselves uh, and just think about themselves. I mean, I always love the thing he said. He said, the trouble with many of my students, he said, is they're not selfish enough. <laughs> if they actually cared about themselves as much as they think they do, uh, they might find it a bit easier to do, some, uh, do so, some, some real work, some real magical work and get their lives aligned. Um, but the world has always been full of distractions. If it wasn't getting a degree or, or, or getting a job, it would be getting something else. It'd be getting a card game organized or, right. you know, getting the garden. We can always put a billion things in the way. Um, if you get up 15 minutes early, you can do an awful lot with 15 minutes. I found. Yes, <laughs> you know? yes definitely. Uh, it, it's the will. You've got to have the will. You've got to have, you've got to fight, you know, that is what is, you need this, this, the volonté. You've got to have the will to do it. Thy will be done. Mm. You know? Uh, on earth as in heaven it's it's that link so so mm. yeah crowley's not addressing the democratic masses he didn't believe in the democratic masses he didn't he wasn't interested in the notion that the majority might be right the majority historically he believed was almost always wrong and had only ever been saved by a, mi a minority of far-sighted people who were able to lead the sheep in the right direction from time to time uh, the tragedy of democracy is we, we're always on the verge of having a complete lunatic in charge of the sheep pen. Mm. Uh, but uh, it's hardly anything new to say. That. Well, there's a fascinating, it's fascinating to me that at the end of Crowley's life, in, um, you know, which is recorded in, in, uh, Magic, in uh, Magic Without Tears, where you know, despite this huge panoply of uh, ideas and philosophies and techniques that he's recommended, he's, he's deeply harping on um, the that the core of his message is that there are higher intelligences that, uh, that it is necessary for humanity to contact them to um, advance its evolution and that the book of the law is the proof of this. Now, for an interesting counterpoint to this, um, you know, I was having a kind of a debate on email recently with a man named Charles Upton who is a Sufi scholar who wrote a book called The, Syst the, what was it? the System of Antichrist where he kind of takes the opposite tack where he says that this is the exact problem that humanity is constantly trying to contact um, 
uh, higher or lower forces and intelligences, and that they are kind of meddling with human history and driving it in in an anti-human direction. Uh, Mm. And I kind of think there's a lot of validity to that. Of course, I got into an argument with him where I was saying, well, what is the angel, the archangel Gabriel appearing to Muhammad in a cave uh, Mm -hmm. to give him the Quran? (laughs) If not, you know, how is that different from an alien abduction experience, for instance? And, uh, you know, or Joseph he, Smith and his plates. <laughs> certainly, right? And, and yeah. these stories are you know, not much different from, uh, you know, while these stories occur throughout the history of the world and, you know, and the reception of the Book of the Law, if one takes that as, as valid, is you know, a similar story. Um, so that, for me, is, is, is another one of Crowley's most challenging um, ideas. And certainly he provides things like um, Kabbalistic tests and things like that to to verify the reality of such intelligences. But, you know, ironically for Crowley, that kind of puts a lot of faith in, um, you know, uh, uh, beings which, you know, maybe, you know, maybe... I couldn't agree. I, I honestly, Jason, I couldn't agree with you more. I think okay. the the whole uh, field of angel summoning from John D. Trithemius in the Renaissance, in the English Renaissance, Onwards, uh, I think addiction to such activities uh, is perilous. Mm. I do. I'm much more with Peladin, uh, the uh, the French mage, um, who believed the essence of magic is is a way of life and an attitude to life, and that one should leave a surgic ritual to, you know, in this in this whole business of angel summoning. Uh, not to be recommended. And uh, I certainly don't think, unless you're a born (laughs) angel contact, uh, you should uh, mess around with this sort of thing at at all, Uh, or be deluded enough to think that every sense of another consciousness that occurs to you is is real or more intelligent than you, and so on and so forth. Uh, I I I don't think Crowley would defer too much if you if you said that the kind of intelligence we're talking about is actually your own <laughs> um but he would say it's more convenient to think of it as a separate separate being in terms of invocation so that you mm. don't get obsessed because right. what tends to happen is that the ego is you see it with intelligent people anyway that if they've written a book and people say what a great book their ego is inflamed mm. and with a couple of years they're writing nonsense because they think that it came from them, right, you know. Right. This is my. I am a genius. I don't go wrong, you know. You, you can rely on me to tell the truth. Uh, the, 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 the tragedy of man is that we, in the in the court of our brain, we can entertain all number of guests, uh, and the ones we like, we tend to identify with, and we think we're the same as. And the end result of this can very often be a, a mental derangement. So, uh, as I said, again, magic is not for everybody. The, uh, an artist is a natural magician in, in many respects. And uh, it, this, it, it, this has always been a problem. Who is initiated? Who isn't? Who do you believe? And all the rest of it. Mm. Uh, which is why I like the do what thou wilt principle, because first of all, you don't rely on others. But um, I think the I, I don't think... There are many cases of people who who felt they were in touch with uh, a higher inspiration, should we say, and who've done great things as a result. But they have to be, what is it Jesus said, uh, allegedly? Um, first, clean the inside of the cup. If you want the new wine poured in, you've got to make sure that the old stuff is well cleaned out and the vessel is pure. And and that is why you have this austerity of moral or ethical conduct uh, thou hast no other right but to do thy will. Um, this is an initiation. I, I don't. You are, you are not talking about an educational program for every every person here. Although the benefits of this way of thinking are of use to everybody, but I think there's a kind. There are different levels at which you can approach it, and I don't think um, play, playing uh, uh, magus. In, in anything but the most serious sense, is, is, would be a sensible thing to advocate. 
and in that sense, you can say, well, should books of Crowley appear in public bookshops? Mm. Um, well, I should say, so long as the people aren't forced to read them, uh, they've got to be obtainable somewhere. <laughs> uh, and many people will gain enlightenment. I think as, as, as the culture develops, hopefully, in long, I think in the long time frame, into people being more spiritually aware, uh, we, will, we will, through experimentation, sort these uh, many of these problems out. But at the moment, we're still in we're still uh, in a kind of chaos, a chaotic situation where we have piles and piles of antique law that's suddenly becoming available to us in a yes. very easy way. Uh, so, it, 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 what would you say? You know, are we going to just um, avoid all this sort of thing, or? Are we going to start working with it? Those who can and who are, as I say, born to do it. Mm. Uh, well, it's interesting that you you suggest suggest to leave theurgical activities to the side, although the the core well, of, the core of Crowley's system. Well, natural born thurgist, my point would be. Well, what what is a natural born thurgist then? Um, well, you know, like in the old tribes in in the um, North American Indians uh, or the Native Americans, as you've now decided to call them. Um, you had certain uh, families that tended to produce the medicine man and whose sure. training was different to the warrior and, and the, the hunter-gatherer and so forth. <clears throat> so you had initiatic traditions where people were raised in a particular way. And I, I, I would say that the, traditionally there's something to be learned from that. There are natural-born magicians. Now, it doesn't mean that your father's a magician, you're going to be one they would often take somebody in from outside. I mean, that's how the old priesthoods developed. Somebody would bring their boy to the local priest, magician, prophet, depending on the culture, and they say, my boy sees things. I can't do anything with him. He doesn't want to work in the shop. You know, He doesn't want to use a bow and arrow, but he sees things and he says remarkable stuff. And, and I think it's your kind of thing. And that young person would be taken on. As, uh, uh, as as the thurgist and so forth. And so there, there was a kind of, they, the society offered that tradition. Now, nowadays, all we've got is, because I, I was an ordinary when I was a boy, um, a young person, I wanted to go in the church because it was the only place to go, you know. Mm. I, so I went to the church and I said, I want to be a priest. Why do you want to be a priest? I said, because I'm aware of God and I, I, I want to be, I want to um, practice that as a way of life in, in, in terms of service to other people. And they said, "Well, that's not good enough." I was constantly told, "You know, you've got to be, you've got to be an accountant, you've got to be a manager, you've got to, you know, modern priests don't do any of that spiritual stuff. They just um, visit old people and are nice, <laughs> you know, do do the services and keep people feeling nice and secure and bourgeois and homely, and that's what priests are. And you don't fit because you've got all this other stuff going on. So, of course, I understand that, that problem, you know." Um, you can't, the disciplines required for effective thergy require a certain amount of separation from the, the rat race. Yes. Mm, yes. You know, so, yeah, I wouldn't, I, you know, I'd be, but it's very difficult to tell a teenager this, you know, <laughs> who's 18 and has read a paperback about Crowley and suddenly decides to spend the weekend with his friends invoking some force or other because they rather like to see what happens. What can you tell them? You know, just careful, son. You know? Right. <laughs> Might bite off more than you can chew here. Um, but interest, you know, you would want to know whether the person had a pure aspiration. Now, our current cult, the materialist culture offers no social role for the spiritual person, yes. it seems to me, other than card readers, you know, fortune tellers. Yes. Uh, you know, there are people setting themselves up on the internet and offering spiritual services, but the culture as a whole doesn't really have this role. And so you end up with a problem because how can they support themselves? So people start taking money and we all know what happens. It, all, it, it becomes very problematic. People often feel, I paid this money to this person and I'm now more screwed up than I was before. <laughs> and and you, you, get, uh, you get the tribe of, of fakers and, and false practitioners. I, I personally can't solve that problem and, I, and reading Alice Crowley's books won't solve it either. Right. Right, right, uh, right. We are we are are going to have to develop um, new arms of society. Now, back in the thirties, people like Rudolf Steiner, 
uh, sorry, back in the 20s uh, type period, it was hoped that the church, the, free, the freer churches would take on the new spiritual knowledge. And that did happen to some extent. Um, but there was always a sort of point of resistance. And you did have priests who were interested in Gnostic spiritual development, uh, but they were very often quickly isolated and um, put down and ended up start having to set up groups of their own. And this sectarianism, I, I, would, I much favor the idea of a broad church with different colleges, like you'd have a college of Gnostics and a college of you know, moral teaching and a college of this and that. Um, but it's very difficult. And when I think about the United States, uh, where you have this remarkable freedom in religion, but it's also circumscribed by the state and the state's power, you've got opportunities to learn. And, uh, you know, I think maybe, maybe you've got a better chance actually in the States than in Western Europe where the, 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 the institutional churches are still not in numbers strong, but but still culturally strong. But I think that's changing too. The fact is, it's all changing, isn't it? And uh, my my view is that Crowley is a significant um, actor in the change of the world society, which is well in advance now, well well in process, with all the reactions which one would expect the hideous reactions to, uh, to freedom right. in the world. I think that's certainly true. I think, and I think we just hit on the, the, the core issue here, which is the, the lack of not only spiritual um, uh, or initiated traditions broadly in Western society, but the, um, you know, the, gen- the genetic, if you will, role of the shaman and how that has largely been discarded by modern civilization. And because of that, uh, the people who have this calling or, um, you know, naturally gravitate towards this um, uh, mode of life, find themselves in the underground, on the fringes, kind of in the, um, in the, and, and, yes, in, suspected. in the counterculture and suspected and mixed up with, um, you know, the, the seedier elements of society and yes. all of the, all of the inherent, you know, problems that go along with that. Um, yeah, that's a that's a huge, you know, very very hard problem to tackle, especially in a um, especially in a culture that values only tech, only the latest technological gadget, money, um, you know, uh, 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 scientism, yeah, material, uh, materialism, and um, so let's let's you know, I was fascinated by some of the things that you had said about how much value Crowley has for uh, young people today. And, uh, you know, not just Crowley, but this whole broad range of um, intellectual investigation or, or practical investigation, um, you know, but it almost seems like we're saddled with the we're saddled with the rebellious image and kind of stuck in the adolescent rebellious loop with some of this stuff because of the necessity of, of kicking back against a society, which is basically just uh, made one profession illegal, as it were. Yes. Yes, it's a great, it's a great problem uh, <clears throat> of the a- aeon of the child, as Crowley would call it. It is an aeon of the child with the positive side, uh, the unrestrained reconnaissance of, of the world, uh, the, the freedom of speech and, and activity. You've got all that, but you've also got this sort of immaturity of the child as well, the truculent uh, aspect of childhood and, and, and you know, rebellion for rebellion's sake. Uh, aspect and mistrust all forms of authority. They're all wrong. They're all out to get me, you know, mm. which generates a terrible paranoia, which can affect young people's development uh, mm. uh, hugely. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think, I think Crowleyan philosophy must be uh, appropriated within a, within a healthy lifestyle. <laughs> I really do. I certainly and agree. By, by, um, we must be clear what we mean by a healthy lifestyle. I think it's one that, that is based on a, a truthfulness and conformity with our nature and um and and uh, and a uh, look to our to our better nature uh, there are there are interesting examples you know um i think for many of course with these t- shall we say tendencies uh, the world of art is attractive so we've had a lot of talented people going to cinema who have these instincts i think of people like george lucas and and uh, some some directors with, which who have got that the gift of bringing newness and magic into life and art 
I think they have their influence. But obviously, um, if we're talking about a changed world in the superficial sense, uh, who's got the mineral resources will decide who owns the water, who has the petrol, who has the most missiles, all these things are the facts. But then again, I think of uh, Jesus again before Pilate. Uh, was it before Pilate or Antipas when he says, my kingdom is not of this world? And um, we, 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 we mustn't, you know, you cannot allow the encroachment of the visible world to entirely dominate your thinking uh, in this in the field we're talking about, um, because that is only uh, has a, has is important, but it has a, a relative value. This all of this can change very very profoundly mm. and very quickly, um, and who can predict the future? I think the principle of do what thou wilt and love is the law, love under will are ironclad and will be, will beat the crisis of consciousness that we've been going through for such a very, very long time uh, in the world of, of trying to find a, a rational form of unrational truth. I, I don't like the word irrational. They always say magic's irrational. It's not unrational. It, reason is in its place. It is not the only and dominant uh, uh, faculty that yes. we we own um gosh i i if i'd known i was going to have to give some sort of uh, um, recipe for a better world <laughs> I, I i think i think you and i know both know that you can only do your best according to what you know yes and um it would be wonderful if somebody was in a position of great influence in government or something if they got the message and and there were sufficient of them to say yes well we're going to put some of our energy into very positive things um but as it is um you know tomorrow's crisis dominates the headlines but uh we have to we have to get our we have to get through all this right and i think i think crowley's uh when we recover the real crowley uh he can if nothing else <laughs> He can give you a, a, a very humorous attitude towards living in this world, and and a world and a way of live a way of coping with it that um, that that enables you to 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 progress. Uh, but perfect societies, utopianism, no, that's not on the cards. Not on the cards at all. Right. And anyway, one man's meat is another man's poison, as we know. Yes. One man's utopia is another man's hellhole, you know. Yes. So, uh, but um, don't let me ramble on. I don't think I'm saying <laughs> anything. <laughs> well, I think I, maybe we should just, you know, I, I, I think that one of the most fascinating things for about Crowley is how much more relevant he becomes instead of less yes. relevant as time goes on and his prediction of, the Aeon of Horus, you know, uh, uh, I think is completely uh, uh, spot on and, and you know, of the kind of the image of God as a terrible child uh, and uh, uh, const- uh, both growing and innocent but also throwing tantrums from time to time. Um, and it seems like regardless of, you know, even if very few people have read Crowley or, or even practiced the techniques, the overall... Um, prediction, as it were, or of the Aeon of Horus, seems to become more and more true constantly, and um, and uh, you know, and Crowley says that can you know that's certainly not utopia. Well, it could become uh, a utopia, but it could also we could also end up in a new dark age. And well, uh, I, I I'm not we, sure which we, way it's going. <laughs> uh, well, I'd say um, <clears throat> where I personally would say we are, insofar as the light of spiritual wisdom is hard to see then we are in a dark age but the light of spiritual wisdom was there in the dark ages too uh the nature of the universe as i understand it is is binary and so in a way the worst thing can happen is a very light period because then you know that something pretty awful is likely Mm. to come up very quickly Uh, at the moment we have what things like this islamic state then before the great fear was com- the communist state. And I just think ahead and think, well, what's going to be the next thing? There'll be something else. You know, there'll always be this foe 
that we're all supposed to be terrified of, and, and in many ways we, we should not be terrified of. We should deal with these things as they come, of course. Mm. Uh, but, but no, uh, are we going in the right direction? Insofar as you're doing your true will and realizing the higher, higher power on earth, you, you're going in a very good direction. You're heading for the one star in sight. Uh, and all one, and you know, wonderful things happen. It's very interesting if you read the depressing writers through time. In many periods of history, they thought, it's the end. The children are rebelling. Nobody wants to know anything. Nobody reads anything anymore. It's not like it used to be. Uh, it's all going downhill. We've got crime. We've got social deprivation. We've got confusion. We've got commentators who've got nothing to say. We've got singers who can't sing, musicians who can't play, you know, all of that. They've always been, the naysayers are always there, but at the same time, there's these yaysayers, but you do have to look for them. Mm. I mean, I had the pleasure recently of discovering the works of John Zorn. Who's yes. a new, do you know him? Yes, of course. Well, you say of course, but in England, he's practically unknown. But okay. I, I, I was lucky to, to, to make a contact, and I, was, I just thought, wow, it made me feel so much better. Dark age, what am I saying? This guy's full of light. You know, that's going on. Yeah. Well, you'll have to visit New York. I, I believe it's still open. He has a, John Zorn has an has a art space in, I think, the Lower East Side where they're just constantly giving um, well, improvisational you you uh, performances. Well, you have a renaissance in New York. You have <laughs> the light in New York. And I'm sure you've got something pretty well in L.A. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> well, you pro- okay, Jim Morrison's gone now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got a, there's bound to be a long well, after. I think, I think there is a renaissance going on, you know. I think so. it's always going on because there's always people in the next generation who are uh, insightful and gifted enough to catch on to the, the real electricity. I mean, there's always the trash. Um, we know that. Uh, but for those seeking you shall find, you'll always have yeah. to look for it. But no, I, no, I don't think it's the total dark age. But of course, we'd all we'd we'd like, you know, the ha- house. If you look at a city from the air and you just see house after house after house after, we'd all love them to be turned on, and wonderful, and praising the higher power, and and not uh, obsessed and watching trash and the minds fill. And we, of course, we'd all like to see that. But um, Demo- the Crowley, you see, this is why people say, but Crowley wasn't democratic. No, because the progress of our species does not depend entirely on common approval. Mm. It's sad, but it's true. It, how many people were at the Monterey Pop Festival in 1967? And how many people, you know, were listening to very dreary old-fashioned music? The, the larger number were not listening to Jimi Hendrix and Otis Redding and, and so on. People now have this image that the 60s was a vast turn-on, but it, it's a terribly small number of people actually got the real essence i mean I'm, i used to know derek taylor the press officer of the, the beatles and he lived in los angeles quite a long time i think he was ran warner brother a big aspect of warner brothers records at one point and talking to him was fascinating about the real 60s and what a small and fascinating group of people it really was and it wasn't it was it, there wasn't this great social change that we're told uh, existed, it, it hardly touched, you know, there were centres of it. But even, you know, George Harrison, I think, said he went to Hyde Ashbury in 67 and was disgusted by it. He said, you know, mm. he, said he felt it was like the Bowery. All these poor kids had turned up there, falling prey to, to exploitation and, and uh, drugs they didn't need or couldn't handle and, uh, you know, end up someday going back home to Minnesota and, sorry for the whole thing and whatever it, it, no it's never been the majority uh we must build those who are aware must build each other up and um and encourage the energy not sit in despair about the nature of the, the world i was I'm very struck by Sir crowley when he said i when it comes to it i don't give a pack of cards for the whole human race i think that's sort of is a necessary sort of feeling you've got to have sometimes and say look don't take it all so seriously. But yes, the planet could puff off in a puff of ash. I mean, not only would that destroy all the wonderful things we're aware of and enjoy, but it would at least destroy all the tra- crap as well. 
But I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, he says, and as an asteroid appears in the sky <laughs> the size of Manchester, I don't think that's going to happen. I, th- I think it's up to us in, in all the generations to build up what we can and use our energy to the, the best and do what thou wilt. And love is the law. They seem to me to be very good guides and uh, be sincere in what we do. Okay. Well, I think that's, an, um, that's a wonderful message and, and uh, uh, certainly agree. So, uh, you know, follow your true will and you could find yourself at the, uh, the center of the yes. action, as yes. it were. Um, and uh, thank you very much for taking the, uh, taking the time to talk to me. It's been a great delight, Jason, and thank you for asking such interesting questions. All right. Thank you very much. And, uh, and the book is called The Beast in Berlin, Alistair Crowley, um, Art, Sex, and Magic in the Weimar Republic, or rather Alistair Crowley, The Beast in Berlin, Art, Sex, and Magic in the Weimar Republic, and it's available now from Inner Traditions, and it was an excellent read. All right. Thank you, Tobias. Thanks, Jason. All right.